Hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde. My name is Dr. Samantha Cotrera and I am the Principal Storytelling Officer for the Histoire Source Source Story video series, a video series for Canadian history teachers where I have a series of conversations with historians and archivists and scholars and creators to ask some questions about primary and secondary sources. In particular, we focus on one source and ask the question, what is the source? What is the story and how can we teach with this source in a way that can challenge our traditional ways that we often talk about Canadian history? I am so excited that we get to have these conversations and all of the people we get to have the conversations with, which includes you. So make sure that you are following us on our social media channels and commenting and liking and sharing and doing all that stuff so we can build this conversation even bigger. We are on Pinterest and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And um, we're active on all of those channels as a way to show you what the show you what the sources are, but also ask questions about what you're doing in your own classrooms. Um, and so we've been really excited about those of you who are already following and sharing and watching, and we are excited to build that even more. I'm extra excited to build that even more because I'm so excited about the types of conversations conversations that I've been able to have through this series. And today, as always, <laughs> is one of those really exciting conversations. Now, I, I, because I did a series in 2020, and I find that often when I do these introductions, I'm like, this one I am so excited about, as if the other ones I'm not. But when I do that for every video, like I'm excited about <laughs> all the videos. So I'm going to do this new thing. Hopefully our editing and our production team um, will help us out with that. I'm going to identify three reasons why I'm extra excited about this particular video. Okay, the reason number one is that we are talking with a pioneer in transgender studies. We are talking with Dr. Aaron DeVar, who has been in this field for 30, 40 years. He is currently the chair of transgender studies at the University of Victoria. And we are so excited to be able to have somebody with that kind of history having these conversations with us. As the chair of transgender studies, he also oversees the archives, the transgender archives, which are also at the University of Victoria that have been around for over 10 years. And one of the things that we get to talk about in today's video is an element or is a, is a piece of that archives that has been digitized just for these conversations. The second reason why I'm very excited about having this conversation is because Statistics Canada has recently identified that over a third of uh, people who identify as LGBTQ plus are under the age of 25. That is a very youthful population. But other studies, such as a 2019 study, and that will be linked below, show that 63% of trans and non-binary youth experience severe emotional distress on a fairly constant constant basis. What helps buffer that type of emotional distress is having supportive families, supportive schools, um, a legal name change. And that study showed that a lot of uh, trans and non-binary youth are finding that their teachers are really responsive to their growing needs as students, but that there is definitely more that can be done. And so this video, our second reason, is that we get to respond and think about those youth in particular to bring some of those histories to our classrooms, to bring some histories around transgender, um, transgender people to our understandings of Canadian history. And the third reason why I'm really excited about this video is that we are talking about what I consider kind of the recent past, the 1980s. Um, uh, students might not, <laughs> but as somebody that was born in the very early 1980s, I am going to think of it as recent past. But we often don't have a lot of new sources to kind of think about this type of period or if we get to that period at all. So today we're going to be talking about a source from the 1980s to talk about what activism, what networking would have looked like in the 1980s that you can bring this source into your classroom to talk about things that we're still talking about today. Like we're really going to historicize a particular moment and for many students their own understandings of their own identity. So because March 31st is International Trans Day of Visibility, I am extra excited that we get to be able to have this conversation for that date and I hope you get to use it for that date but then also 
uh, you know, also days, months, years beyond this. So before we go over to Zoom, I just want to remind you to subscribe, uh, like the video if you like it, comment below about how you might use this um, in your classroom and other sources that perhaps the uh, transgender archives at University of Victoria could explore and see if they can find to make useful in your classrooms as well. So let's go over to Zoom and have a what I can only imagine is going to be an excellent conversation. Erin, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in our Histoire Source Source Story video series. I'm really excited to have you here today. Before we begin, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Samantha. I'm very happy to be here. And before I say anything about me, I would like to just say that uh, we are, the, I'm at the University of Victoria in Victoria, British Columbia, and we are on uh, the uh, traditional territory of the Okanagan-speaking people, and uh, also the Song, He's Esquimalt, and Masonish people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Uh, so I am Aaron DeVore, and um, I am the chair in transgender studies at the University of Victoria. Uh, when this started in 2016, it was the first chair in transgender studies anywhere in the world. I'm very pleased to say there's now another one at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, I'm also the founder of the Transgender Archives, which is the largest collection of transgender historical materials, original historical materials anywhere in the world. And I'm also the founder of Moving Trans History Forward conferences, which happen every two years, and I invite everybody to join us. The next one is in the spring of 2023, and after that will be the spring of 2025. And uh, I'm also a professor of sociology at the University of Victoria. When I was introducing you in the beginning before you came, I was like, Oh wait! I don't think well, I don't think he's an actual historian, <laughs> and, and it was so interesting because I love having history conversations with people coming from so many different backgrounds. And it occurred to me when we had talked that I, I was like, I don't think I ever verified if you were a historian, and so no, it's a sociologist, obviously. But I think the connection with building archives demonstrates the ways that when we only talk about archives in these historical contexts, we miss so many elements of what an archive can be and can do. And the archive has been around for over 10 years now, is that correct? We started the Transgender Archives in the fall of 2011. And so we've now completed 10 years and are having this year a cycle of events to celebrate the completion of the first 10 years of the Transgender Archives. Well, I think at the end we'll um, go to the website to explore a little bit more so people know how they can access the archives, but also the events. But today we're going to talk about a source from the archives. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so what is have... the source? <laughs> okay, so uh, let me uh, put it up on the screen just for a moment. I have chosen a publication that is called Metamorphosis. And uh, you can see on your screen that it dates back to 1982. And there's a number of uh, different bits written on it that are not part of the original document. So there's this stamp up here, there's a note at the top, and there's somebody's handwritten notes here. So this document brings together several different historical figures in trans um, history and trans activism and trans movement. And so I'd like to uh, take a moment to introduce each of those figures and then talk a little bit more about the document itself. Uh, so this document, Metamorphosis, was created by an individual by the name of Rupert Raj. And uh, he is... Uh, living currently in Portugal. And he is a trans man who is of Eurasian background. So his father was from India and his mother was from Poland. And he transitioned in 1971, so quite a long time ago. And you can see some pictures here from when he was younger and not quite as young and Within the last few years are these two photographs. The well, one's a, a drawing and the other one is a photograph. And so he transitioned in 1971 and he was an early activist. He started an organization along with another woman by the name of Diana Lamont 
started an organization called the Association for Canadian Transsexuals in the 1970s. Another one in the late 1970s, 1978, called Foundation for the Advancement of Canadian Transsexuals, and then started the organization Metamorphosis that put out this magazine, which ran from, or this newsletter, which ran from 1982 to 1988. So I said it brings together several people. So Rupert Raj was the person who put out this newsletter for those number of years. Now across the top and, and here, this is a stamp from an organization called the Erickson Educational Foundation. And across the top here is a note that says, sent copies to Zelda and P. Walker. And Zelda was Zelda Supli, a fascinating individual that maybe another time we could talk about more, uh, who ran the office of the Erickson Educational Foundation. And Paul Walker was a uh, therapist who was very active in serving the trans community for um, many years. He's now deceased. And as I said, this is the stamp from his organization. And then he makes this note, the journal of a not transsexual. And I'll come back to the content here a little bit later, but now let me tell you a little bit about Reed Erickson and the Erickson Educational Foundation. As I say, this document brings together several strands of history. And of course, Samantha, if you have any questions along the way, please just jump in. I, I would be happy to jump in, <laughs> but I am just very fascinated. So please just continue. <laughs> okay, will do. So. This is Reed Erickson, and Reed Erickson lived from 1917 to 1992. Uh, he was also a trans man, and he was a very unusual and significant and largely unsung figure. Uh, he was an American, and he was born into a, a family. Uh, his parents both came from humble beginnings, but by the time uh, Reed Erickson was an adult, they had made significant money. And then he took over his father's business. Uh, he was an, trained as an engineer. And the business was, you might call it lead recycling in today's terms, uh, at a time when gasoline that was used in automobiles and um, aircraft and a variety of other places had lead in it. And so producing, providing lead was very important business at the time. And the business was located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And Reed Erickson transitioned from female to male. So he was a trans man in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the early 1960s. And Baton Rouge, Louisiana is today a relatively conservative place and is part of a um, common called the Bible Belt, very religious Christian people are very common there and, and hold a lot of sway in the, the society. Well, try and dial that back 60 years to a time when uh, racial segregation was taken for granted, uh, that um, there, was, there was no concept of transgender, there was no concept of non-binary, there was really very little concept that there might be something called gender that was not exactly the same as sex. Uh, and here is a person who is changing from a woman to a man in front of everybody's eyes in this community. So he went on to um, amass a lot of money, uh, mostly because he bought some land that had oil on it. And he became very, very wealthy. And one of the things he did was he established the Erickson Educational Foundation. And the Erickson Educational Foundation in the late 1960s through the 1970s and into the beginning of the 1980s was the main source for funding for almost everything that happened concerning trans people. And at the time, the word, as you saw in the document we'll be talking about, was transsexual. The word transgender had not yet been invented. The words non-binary had not yet been invented. And as I said before, gender had barely been invented. Reed Erickson, had a copy of this particular uh, metamorphosis newsletter that Rupert Raj put out. And the stamp on there is his stamp that says, this is part of my collection. And everything that went into his collection got the stamp on it. And then he sent a copy to the, one of the preeminent therapists at the time, Paul Walker. He sent a copy to Zelda Supli, who ran his office. And then he wrote on it, not a transsexual. So why is this particular document of interest to us? 
the original newsletter said Journal of a Transsexual. And Erickson wrote in, not a transsexual. And then further uh, wrote in around the edge, uh, homosexual. Okay. And so I picked this document because this article here is an article written by another individual who became very important in trans history. And also because this debate is of who is a trans person and who is not a trans person is still happening today. So this document, 1982, is 40 years ago. And people were arguing then about, well, who counts and who doesn't. Then it was who counts as transsexual, now it's who counts as transgender. The language has changed and the definitions of where those boundaries are of who's in and who's out has changed. Uh, but the debate is still going on. And if you go today into the pages of uh, social media and to Tumblr and, and Twitter and all of those other, all the places that people argue about things, uh, you will find there is a debate still going on. So we'll come back to what that debate is. But let me introduce the person who wrote this, who became an important figure. Uh, so this is, this is the document that it's about. And in fact, I have a copy of it. Uh, let me stop the share while I show you. That's an image of it, but here's an actual copy of it. Okay. This was published in 1990. Oh, sorry, 1980. And it was uh, very controversial. And there's a lot of debate about it, but I want you to see how small it is. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, I, when, you, when you like moved it, I was like, oh, that, where did it I go? Know what size I was <laughs> expecting, but it wasn't okay. that. It's a little tiny, tiny pamphlet. I don't have big hands. You can see how big it is. Yeah. And not only that, the print is very large as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So there's not much to it. The whole thing is how many pages is it? 20 pages. 21, 20 and a half pages. Right. right. Tiny little thing. But it was very influential. It became a very important piece of work. Now, to try and find an original copy of this today is very difficult. Hardly anybody has one, but I've been around for a while, so I have one. <laughs> and I doubt you could find one that would be 50 cents now. Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, later. Um, just really quickly, though, what I, what, you know, like uh, at the teacher brain that I'm thinking of is like, it's so really cool to see sources that are like small and accessible like that, because I also feel like they're good invitations to be like, well, a student could do this as an assignment to do a diary like this, right? And even do a little publication. And so anyway, I just thought of that too. Please continue. Yeah, I mean, today you, we would probably call this a zine, uh, but right, right, it right. was uh, 50 cents as you noted. And it was published by an organization called Worldview Publishers. And it, does it say it in here? Yes, it says right in here. This is a Workers' World Party publication. So Diane Leslie Feinberg is the name that they were using at this point, uh, was a lifelong communist. And this was who published this. So this came from the radical far, far, far left of the day, right? That's where this was published. And that's the only place that you could get someone to publish something this, like this at, at the time if you didn't self-publish, which is what Rupert Raj was doing. Uh, so- Well, and it also, that also highlights like the intersection of a lot of different things, right? The intersection of issues related to labor as well as identity and gender and sexuality and race and, and like that, that's such an interesting dimension of, for that. And, and uh, this person who at this point called themselves Diane Leslie through the rest of their lives was known as Leslie Feinberg. And Leslie Feinberg was very sensitive to those issues. And in fact, the content of this is very much about their life trying to live in the world in a, a, what we today would call a non-binary kind of presentation. And so the story in brief that is, starts in here and shows up in a number of different publications, which I'll talk about in a moment, one of which might be familiar to people, uh, is that they entered a program for uh, transsexuals to convert themselves from one gender to the other, starting out as female and move down the road towards becoming male. Uh, took hormones, had upper surgery, their voice changed, they grew facial hair, uh, 
the upper surgery left them with a, a flat chest. They were four years in the program and then decided it wasn't for them. Okay, so that's why it's called Journal of a Transsexual and Erickson wrote in not. And Rupert Raj's story in the Metamorphosis newsletter was about not a transsexual. And Leslie Feinberg also concluded they were not a transsexual. But this is the story in the little pamphlet, the little booklet is about what a day-to-day -day life was like for someone in 1982, I think, 1980. Doesn't say what year it was here, does it? Sorry, no, it doesn't give us a year. Just starts on Monday, July 2nd, but it's published in 1980. So it could be 1979, it could be 1980. Uh, and gives us what several days, 20 pages, not very many days in the life is like, and how almost every day there are insults, assaults. Uh, one time the, the Feinberg had to run from the police. Uh, every day was a trial of survival. And quite literally, you know, getting beaten uh, or threatened to be beaten on a regular basis and how difficult it was to hold, get a job, hold a job, uh, go to the bathroom anywhere, anytime. And just, and it's only a few pages <laughs> and it's heartrending. It's just heartrending the stories of how difficult it was to be an in-between person, someone who was believed and identified themselves as a woman, but nobody else recognized them as a woman and who wanted to live as a masculine woman in a world that had no place for a masculine woman and had tried living as a trans man and decided that wasn't right for them either. So that's what that little booklet is about. Now, later- And that was, little booklet, just really quickly, and like, it, it's so small, like we were talking about, and that has so much in it and it's not, so particular to 1980 because I'm sure I know there's so many people that feel that way now and that would have felt that way for centuries before that was even written and like locating it locating it 40 years ago was such a powerful way to remember the the historicity of these conversations like you identified with the metamorphosis uh, newsletter the the, the issues change over the years some and much of it is is still very much here there are still many people who are dealing with the same issues the language is a little different the circumstances are different uh, there's more room for people like leslie feinberg today but absolutely there's lots more room but that doesn't mean that everyone who walks through the world like that um, finds that room is there for them the next publication was this one, also tiny. Yeah. Okay. This came out in uh, 1992. So, you know, just, a, sorry. Yes, 1992. So this one is 1980. Okay. So 12 years later, this came out in 1992. And it's tiny as well, but it made an, an, an impact because it talked about that trans people have always been here. And it gave some stories of the history of trans people who have always been here. And you can see uh, images around the outside of the text and also here, images of different individuals. And some people who know something about trans history may recognize a few of these individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll note Leslie Feinberg was quite sensitive to race issues. And you'll note that they're, they're not all white. And mm -hmm. so that was uh, Leslie being white. So that was uh, white and Jewish. Uh, so that was an influential little pamphlet that made an impact. And then uh, they published another book, which made a, a big impact. Uh, 1996 is this one. This, this is what that little pamphlet I just showed you turned into. Right. All right, so this is a this is what you think of as a real book, as opposed to a pamphlet. And 
trans, uh, transgender warriors is, is continues to be very influ influential today. You'll see this quoted all the time. I wanted to introduce Leslie Feinberg a little bit and also to focus on their use of pronouns, because pronouns is also a very big topic that people are arguing about today and trying to sort out. So Leslie Feinberg used these pronouns. She and her, and Z and here here being, both of these being gender neutral, that have not really caught on, but they're still used a little bit. Uh, so the book that I mentioned that came out in between the uh, pamphlets and the Transgender Warrior book, that was a very important book that was recently reissued 25 years after its original issue. And it's called Stone Butch Blues. And it takes the story from the little tiny pamphlet, the Journal of the Transsexual, which was published as biographical and turns it into a novel, which Leslie Feinberg says is not an autobiography, but I will say is very autobiographical. So right. you recognize if you've read the little pamphlet and heard them speak here and so on, you'll recognize that many of the stories in Stone, Stone Butch Blues are really based on their personal experiences. This book, as I say, was reissued as somebody who was 20 something uh, reviewed it when it was reissued. So 25 years later, we've been 2018 uh, and said it's still powerful for her generation as well. because it's a whole generation later. Uh, I have never met somebody who has read this book and has not been brought to tears. It is a very, very moving book. So this is a story of somebody, a fictional character, who lived that life and takes off from that little booklet, that little pamphlet, and tells the story in a great deal of depth and in a very moving way. So here's what Feinberg said about pronouns. I care which pronoun is used, but people have been disrespectful to me with the right pronoun and respectful with the wrong one. It matters whether someone is using the pronoun as a bigot or if they're trying to demonstrate respect. So I think this is something to bear in mind because there's a lot of policing of pronouns mm -hmm. that goes on today. And there are, as Feinberg was willing to say, and acknowledge that there are people who don't really know what is the current predominant opinion about how you're supposed to use pronouns. And they're trying to be respectful. And that's the important thing. That's more important is how they treat somebody with respect and dignity than whether they know where the politically correct place is in terms of pronouns. And I will say as someone who is deeply embedded in this community, it changes very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And it's not always that easy to keep up. And so I put this up here as that's part, all part of this discussion about what counts as trans, who is trans, who is not, and how you're supposed to treat people who are or are not. Uh, Leslie Feinberg uh, was married. So you, there's Leslie Feinberg on the, on the right with their partner, Minnie Bruce Pratt, who was a, a poet, uh, who is a poet and, and uh, an activist as well. Uh, Leslie Feinberg died in 2014. And Leslie's partner, wife, Minnie Bruce Pratt wrote, she died at home in Syracuse, New York, with her partner and spouse of 22 years, Minnie Bruce Pratt, at her side. So her partner used she and her. Leslie Feinberg went among trans men, was happy to be he and him, went among lesbians, or obviously at home with her partner, was happy with she and her, but in public, liked something, uh, sometimes use uh, Z and here. Another comment on pronouns. Uh, for me, pronouns are always placed within context. I am female bodied. I am a butch lesbian, a transgender lesbian. Referring to me as she and her is appropriate. 
particularly in a non-trans setting in which referring to me as he would appear to resolve the social contradiction between my birth sex and my gender expression and render my transgender expression invisible. I like the gender neutral pronoun, uh, Z and here, uh, because it makes it impossible to hold on to the gender sex sexuality assumptions about a person you're about to meet or you've just met. So Leslie Feinberg didn't want to disappear. Didn't want to just become an un unremarkable man because you could look at Leslie Feinberg and you could just go he and him and doesn't challenge anything about the status quo. Doesn't challenge anything about people's understandings of gender and sex and sexuality. And Leslie Feinberg wanted to challenge those um, assumptions at all times. Thank you so much for all of that. Like, you know, one of the goals of this series is to show all of the stories and the complexities of history using a source. And the fact that you started with metamorphosis and we haven't even like looked at the text, but just the notes around it, the annotations around it, to be able to demonstrate the scope of history, the scope of history that are definitely not taught in schools. Maybe people will see it in the sexuality studies or gender and women's studies program at undergrad, but that these are these are activists and these are conversations that that continue to affect young people's lives and that can bring so much richness into their understandings of themselves and the past and the the people that have gone before them to to make it a little bit safer for some people in some spaces to be their full selves, um, that it's just so powerful. So thank you so much for demonstrating the source and all of those stories that come with. Um, you know, one of the ways, one of the things that we like to do in this video series is to think about like, how can we use this history, uh, how can we use this source and these stories to challenge Canadian history? How can we bring them into the classroom to do that? But I think also what's a really powerful question is like, how could we use a source like this and the histories that you were just sharing to challenge how we think about the Canadian present in ways that teachers can bring that into their classrooms to demonstrate to students that historical continuity and where we are in the current moment. So this is an editorial basically by Rupert Rush, and again, written in 40 years ago. And what he's talking about here, which uh, the notations tell you that Reed Erickson agreed with him. Uh, what he's talking about here is trying to make the point that there is a very clear, bright line between who is a lesbian and who is a transsexual. So we don't really need to go through the text a whole lot, but I, I just wanted to put it back up here to say that this is an editorial, actually. I, want you to, I wanted to be, to be clear about that. Uh, so at the time, the debate about who counts as trans was the line that they were trying to establish about who counts and who doesn't was in a very different place than it is today. Mm -hmm. And so we have a long history in the popular social imagination of thinking of lesbians as women who want to be men. And that was at this time really the strongest version of public understanding of what a lesbian was. So if somebody started out with a signed female at birth and wanted to be accepted as a trans man, they had to very clearly convince people they were not just a lesbian who took it too far. Right? And so that's what this editorial is about. Mm -hmm. And there is this rejection of Leslie Feinberg saying, no, you're not a trans man. You're a lesbian. And we need to be perfectly clear about who is a lesbian and who is a trans man, because the public thinks we're all the same thing. And the trans men did not want to be taken as lesbians, not at all. Okay. And Leslie Feinberg was a problem then and through all the rest of what I told you about, because Leslie Feinberg blurred that line. Yeah. And was happy to blur that line and thought that that was a revolutionary thing to do. 
because coming out of a communist background, revolutionary was a word that they like to use in, among the communists, right? But it was a radical thing to do. And it, Leslie proved to be right about it being a radical thing to do. But in 1982, it was very, very important to draw, the, draw a clear line between what's a lesbian, who is a lesbian, and who is a trans man. And that's what the editorial was about. You know, and like, you know, that hasn't gone away. It, I mean, it, it seems different. It looks different. It could sound different. But that type of like making these strict lines are not things that would surprise many people. And a lot of times when I'm so inspired by youth, by the ways that they push against any sort of boundaries or any sort of binaries to be like, there's a like there's so much middle why why do we have to categorize and it's it's so interesting that that's coming up in the 1980s it's not surprising but i guess you can think about you you could assume these histories are just all inclusive and so it's interesting that it's coming up within the different communities as well well and the other thing that's happening today that is not publicized very much but there are today uh, lots of women who identify as butch and are not interested in being trans and have a presentation that is just as masculine as Leslie Feinberg. Some mm -hmm. of them even have upper surgery. Some of them even do some hormones, but they identify themselves as butch lesbians. And they are feeling a lot of pressure to identify themselves as trans men. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it goes in many different directions. And it's not resolved yet. So this is why I chose this piece to talk about, because I feel like it has a lot of relevance still to debates that are happening today. And I think it's helpful for people to know that these are not brand new debates, not at all. I think it's essential for, for young people to know, because it I think it helps people understand their own identities and their own histories, right? Like it's there's so many people that are left out of the histories that we teach and learn in some of our classrooms and the more inclusive we can be to identify the variety of different people and experiences and feelings and ways to understand themselves and identities in the past just help solidify that in the the, the present and the future as well i know that metamorphosis there are some issues that are available on the archives websites, and this issue is, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, it, and it is linked below, <laughs> and it will be linked below when we're doing this. And um, I know not everything in the archives is digitized and available, but, uh, but there is a lot, and it isn't just Canadian. Maybe for our last couple of minutes together, you could tell us a little bit about the archives and how people can access the collections and how we can access um, you and the, the chairship and the archives as well. So the Transgender Archives has a website that uh, is uh, gives us uh, on the this is the home page. There is a little introduction video that people can look at. It's just a few minutes to give you a feeling for it. And of course, we have our collections. This gives you an idea of what they are. You can click on any one of them and it tells you a little bit about them. And we have a separate section that are the digital collections. And so most of it is is um, original materials and hard, hard copy. So for those who are not accustomed to thinking about archives, archives are the raw material that historians use to write the history. And very little of the history of transgender people is written. We have material from 23 countries on every continent except Antarctica in 13 languages. And archivists say, how big is your archive? We're trying to describe what we have. They say, well, if we put it all in one big shelf, how long is that shelf? And in our case, the shelf would be a football field and a half long. Wow. So there's a lot of material there and it's still just scratching the surface and we're yeah. collecting more all the time. Transgender Archives is, uh, is also associated with the chair in transgender studies, which is the position I hold. Uh, this is our website. There's a link to the Transgender Archives here. And uh, we do a lot of different things, uh, helping to operate the archives, which is owned by the University of Victoria Libraries and is supported by the University of Victoria Libraries. Uh, but Chair is kind of the, 
public face of the archives. Uh, so the chair does a bunch of other things as well. We have a lecture series. Here's one of our lecturers coming up. Uh, we do public events. The Trans Day of Visibility is coming up soon. Uh, we have a scholarships and fellowships program, we, which is open now, but it's scholarships and fellowships only for university students and for people in the community. So I guess a high school student could apply for one of the community fellowships. So that I would, shouldn't say that it's, it's out of the question for a high school well, student. Well, and a well. high school student could very well become one of your college university students in a couple yes. of years. Yes, and they should be aware that we have, um, yeah. we have scholarships for people who are trans plus, so any kind of trans and doing any work in any area. And we also have scholarships for people of any gender doing work about transgender. And so we have both of both kinds. The other big thing that we do is we put on these conferences, which are called Moving Trans History Forward. So the last one was 2021. We don't have anything up yet about 2023. Uh, we had Miss Major as a keynote speaker, who was one of the people who was there at Stonewall and is a black trans woman activist who's been active for 50 years. Uh, and she was uh, fabulous. So it's a four day conference. The last one was entirely online. The next one we expect to be both online and in person. Uh, we had just shy of 400 people attend the last one. From it's amazing. 20, 23 countries around the world. Uh, time zones was interesting, but there you go. We, we, we did it. Uh, the next one will be hybrid. So there'll be an in-person and a parallel, hopefully well-integrated online conference. So I wanted to also mention the YouTube channel. So uh, we have uh, quite an extensive YouTube channel. We are on social media in general, uh, but I want to recommend the YouTube channel. This is an introduction to the chair in transgender studies. <clears throat> we have highlights from the conferences, four days and 11 minutes, the different panels. Uh, but we also have our speakers and uh, many, many others. So uh, this is just the front page that I think there are, I think it's 120 or so YouTube videos. So there's a lot of educational uh, value in these YouTube videos and are available to anybody 24 seven. How exciting. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, Aaron, this has been great. I don't think I have done a video where I talked so little and have learned so much. So <laughs> thank you. And I really, like I said, I really appreciate the fact that you know, you were really able to highlight all of the different stories and the different challenges and the ways that we can really think about archival material and like even just talking about the notations and the annotations on these sources and um, how many things that we can pull from these these sources and these stories. And I think the fact that the archives are available, the conference materials are available. Um, I'm sure everyone has found this as fascinating as I and I hope that it leads to more educators maybe contacting you for some collaborations. I actually have some ideas myself that I won't say them while we're filming. I'll say them afterwards to see maybe if there's other ways that we could like uh, partner and kind of bring more of this to teachers. So thank you so much for this wonderful talk today. <laughs>